OK, so we're going to go ahead and start. Hi. OK, just um, again a reminder that you have a fourth response paper due on Thursday, uploaded by 11.59 PM to turn it in. And um, if you wanted to start planning for your fifth response paper, it's simply going to be on the Holocaust memoir that you'll be reading for your section. And so obviously I would be sure to have read that memoir. And then you'll be talking with your, that Holocaust survivor in section on either March 3rd or March 10th. Uh, the response paper itself will be due March 10th. That'll be the last one. And so we're still obviously you know, three, and a, three and a half weeks away from that paper. But if you wanted to start planning, and many of you like to start planning, just be sure in the next three and a half weeks to have read the memoir of the survivor who you'll be meeting with in section. Um, one thing to note about that is if you, you'll notice we're going to switch around some of the section times. It may be that you have to come to a, perhaps a different section meeting uh, that day, day, depending, or just to like try to have some flexibility given that I can't really ask the survivors to be here for three or four hours at a time uh, since it's taxing for them. Um, but uh, yeah, the fourth response paper on Shoah and Schindler's List, the fifth on the survivor memoir. I'll post uh, the fifth as well probably this week just so you can have ample time. Are there questions or any concerns before we get started? No? Okay. Well, we're going to shift today to a very different film. Uh, so we talked uh, last week extensively about Schindler's List. We left off on almost a kind of debate that I thought was very fruitful in the class about uh, sort of Hollywood-esque effects in Schindler's List and ways in which the film was both representative and radically unrepresentative of the Holocaust. And um, we also appreciated a number of the film techniques that Spielberg used to uh, tell a very, I think, profound and compelling story. And today we're going to shift to a different kind of film and a different kind of filmmaker and also look at the way in which he's engaged in storytelling, because he is, and also look at some of the film techniques that he uses, which differ in a number of ways dramatically from Spielberg, but yet there's a number of places, I think, as well, where they both take certain liberties and stretch, um, perhaps even maybe ethically stretch, what film can do. And, uh, and I want to confront that because some of the footage that you'll see from Lanzmann is not only extraordinary as footage, but it's also extraordinary as a film and I think achieves a very different kind of effect than Schindler's List, but one which would still raise questions for us about the techniques that are being used and perhaps um, various lines that have been crossed or not crossed in the production of the film. So Lanzmann is a French filmmaker, uh, born in 1925, still alive uh, today. Um, he is obviously best known for the film that we watched or the portions that we watched, uh, Shoah. And uh, I should just say that this is a condensation of hundreds of hours of testimony that he shot on location uh, in many different places in the world over about 11 years. And so in some ways it's a kind of a, a term that we might use today, is we might call it like a database documentary. That is he created a huge database of testimony and then he selected material out of that database and organized it into uh, a film which we see uh, called Shoah. It was mostly shot, as you can sort of tell by just the way it looks, mostly shot in the 1970s and early 80s. Um, the film uh, took a long time to obviously edit and create. Um, it's a multilingual film, so primarily Yiddish, Polish, Hebrew, English, French, Lanzmann and German. Lanzmann himself speaks uh, French and German and English in the film. He doesn't speak Polish. He doesn't speak Russian. Um, I think maybe a little bit of Hebrew. And so there's often a translator there uh, who does the translation, especially when he's talking uh, to folks in Poland. To remind you of the word Shoah, um, hopefully you remember from day one what the term means. Um, so this is a term that was contemporaneous with the events that we now understand to be the Holocaust. 
And it's a Hebrew term which means simply destruction. And so to talk about a Shoah is really to also foreground the victim's perspective, right? The victim said, this is a Shoah. The Germans said they were doing, the Nazi Germans said they were doing something else. They were doing an annihilation, a Vernichtung, right? Remember those two words that I gave you at the very beginning of class. So from the perspective of the perpetrators, annihilation. From the perspectives of the victims, it's destruction of a community, families, people, religion, culture, all of those things. And it's a term that was contemporaneous in the early 1940s with the destruction of the Jewish communities in Poland. So to call it Shoah is really, again, to kind of adopt a victim's perspective. And also, I'd say, to create a kind of sense of the capaciousness of the ambition, right? Schindler's List, I ended last time by saying it was a single person who had created a list, right? And I mean, it was an, it's really an individual story. And of course, the larger consequences of that story are, you know, played out in the film. Shoah has a different kind of ambition. I mean, in many ways, by calling it Shoah, also kind of gives you a sense of the magnitude and the enormity of the task at hand. Right? And you get that from the fact that it's you know, many different languages, and you have really the three major groups represented throughout the film. Victims, perpetrators, and bystanders. And there's a lot of testimony that comes from all three. And what's really interesting, I think, about the film is the way in which that testimony begins to intersect. So that one person says something that's then maybe corroborated by someone else, and another person provides another piece of the testimony, and at the end, you get this kind of mosaic of intersecting testimonies. And, um, you know, that becomes, I think, part of the, I think that part of the explanation as to how he's using film. So it's not only to capture testimony, but I'd say it's also as, has a kind of corroborative uh, aspect that is meant, it's meant to kind of confirm a reality. I think you had asked me a question last time about the question of denial. And I said so much of what his film is about is about making sure denial is impossible. And he does that because you have people in different places who don't necessarily know each other or interact with each other years after it took place saying things that will then corroborate the testimony of someone else. And that's really interesting because this is a strategic way of using film to also produce almost like proof of an event. The other aspect of the film is really its forensic aspect. And I mentioned that term last time. I and mean, when we think about forensics, you know, you're thinking about an investigation of a crime. And in some ways, that's what he's doing. He's investigating a crime. He's investigating a crime of huge magnitude, right? A genocide. And that means you're going to be looking at a lot of things. You're going to be listening to testimony, eyewitnesses. But it's not enough just to listen to eyewitnesses. You have to look at documents. And so there's a very careful scrutiny of documents, you know, produced uh, by the Nazis, whether it's, you know, railroad uh, plans of like, you know, when the trains left and what they did, or whether it was the re-outfitting of carbon monoxide gas vans. These are documents that are looked at with kind of great um, scrutiny. He also looks at ruins, remains, like the actual locations where things have took place. And that also means you go back to these places, and again, you're talking about, you know, if you're doing your filming in 1975, you're at least 30 years out, sometimes 40 years out. Things are not so visible, right? I mean, they've fallen into ruin, grass has grown over them, um, you know, they're not really that well marked. And at this time, especially in Poland, the Holocaust was, in the 1970s and 80s, was not really part of the national ethos. Uh, it wasn't a lot of kind of recognition of memorials and museums, and the same thing in Germany. So most of what he's doing, we don't have the museums that we have today. We didn't have the, uh, the kind of the ongoing um, kind of memorial culture that we understand and it's available for like school children. It's available for you know, people, the general public. That didn't exist in the 1970s. And so in many ways, the film also was very path-breaking in this regard because it was the beginnings of producing a culture of memory, especially out of the ruins and erasure that had happened in the intervening decades. So the fact that there's a lot of grass growing in Kelmno and you can't really see what's going on there, that's part of the point.
it's like a kind of an amnesia that has happened, and he's wanting to kind of unpack that. What's amazing is how young the survivors are. Mm. Like, those are survivors, they're too young, but then they're like, oh, this is 20 years ago. Yeah. Way longer. When the book still in there. Right. Right. This is a really important point, is that if you're used to seeing like, the testimonies from the Shoah Foundation, so you might think of like Brene Firestones that we looked at, or if you meet survivors today, they're generally in their 90s. Um, most of the people in this film are still like in their 50s, 60s. Um, and so obviously, you know, their closeness to the event is, I mean, they're, you know, they're not close, but they're close, <laughs> you know? And, and you're right, it's kind of striking because uh, we know the march of time, biology, you know, moves us all forward. And, and you're right, this um, is one of the most it may be the most systematic attempt to capture testimony of these different groups that, it, that I wouldn't say ever was created because the Shoah Foundation itself is, brought, is bigger. However, in terms of creating a feature length film, uh, I think certainly this film stands as a unique document. Um, and I want to say is one other thing, and then we're going to kind of talk about some of the you know, techniques that he uses before we look at a number of segments today, is that there's also he makes a decision as a filmmaker about what he's going to do and not do. And one of the things I want to say that's really significant here, because it kind of goes towards his, I would say, his outburst with regard to Schindler's List, right? His outrage towards that film. He basically says, I'm not going to do anything like that. I'm not going to reenact the past. I'm not going to kind of like create a stage where I give actors and actresses roles and they essentially tell a story that's meant to transport the viewers back in time to see something unfold before our eyes. So in this regard, he refuses to use not only historical footage, right? So he will look at documents, though. But he doesn't want to use any historical film, although some historical film does exist. He does, certainly doesn't want to have any historical reenactment. But he does want testimony, and we'll have to talk a lot about the way in which he gets testimony, because there, he may not be restaging testimony, but he's certainly staging testimony. That is to say, he's doing certain things in order to elicit a story that's been buried deep inside someone's head. And oftentimes, I'd say, he kind of like prods and pulls and pokes and does things that maybe, you know, push it really far in order to get a really good story. And he gets a lot of really good stories. How did he get financing support for such a huge project in such a long period of time? That's a good question. I don't actually know how the film was financed. I have to look it up. Uh, your question is, how was it financed over the time? I, I don't, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, but um, maybe someone in here does know. Anyone? I'll look it up. I don't know. I don't know. Good question. So, um, you know, in some ways, I think this is also a, a labor of like great love and passion. And this was something that this was a film that he was driven to do for very personal uh, reasons. And I don't know how much of it was self-funded, but I imagine some of it was. So let's talk a little bit. I'm going to go back to Lanzmann's critique of Schindler's List because I had shown you this last time. And now that we've seen some of Shoah, we can kind of maybe understand some of the differences. And I wanted you to think as I reread this quote, what I want you to do is think about how you would characterize the film in comparison now to Schindler's List. And you think about it in terms of like the content, the film techniques, its structure, and perhaps the intention of the director. Like what are they trying to achieve? What are they trying to do? And of course, you know, there's a lot of differences. So I want to figure out what they are. So he says about his own film, so is not digestible which implies that Schindler's List is digestible, right? It's not a fairy tale, which again implies that Schindler's List is a fairy tale. A film like Schindler's List builds bridges. It implies that Shoah does not. It's an absolute distortion of historical truth, which again implies that Shoah is not an absolute distortion of historical truth, and I would agree it's not, despite the fact that the story of Oscar Schindler is true, which is an interesting kind of uh, thing to say is not what happened to the vast majority of Jews. The truth is extermination, death wins. And so one would also then imply that Shoah shows you the truth, which is extermination, death wins. So it's a, it's, it's a mighty, you know, 
passionate indictment of, of Schindler's List, perhaps one that personally I would characterize as unfair, but nevertheless, I still think you know, we should confront it. You may think it's fair, others may not. We had a good debate about Schindler's List last time. I thought it was really very powerful. Um, I would encourage you in your papers also to think about these kind of things, like argue, argue what you want. You know, I think that it's really, it's a wide range of interpretation for both of these films. Um, personally, I think this indictment is too strong. However, I do see some differences. And so to begin, you know, if you had to characterize some of the differences in terms of the techniques, the content, the structure, intention, what kind of things would come to mind? What show a versus Schindler's List. Assuming you saw some of that, yeah. Well, I think like Schindler's List has a lot more elements like auteur theory, like you could see a lot of like classic Spielberg in there, like with the techniques he uses, with the faces, and like the, he's also like the setting and stuff that he creates. Um, it's all like actors and like reenactments. Mm -hmm. Mm. It's the absence of certain things that are in Schindler's List, but yet still creates the same effect, which is a really interesting observation. And those things that are absent are, I guess, the, the elements that would recreate all the, you know, the corpses you mentioned, but also the gas chambers, you know, the, the recreation of that Auschwitz gassing scene, you know, of the women that we ended up with last time. That, I think, you know, would make Claude Lanzmann, you know, fly off his handle, right? That is exactly the opposite of what he would want to do in, you know, in a film, in his film. What else? Yeah, this is a really interesting point too. So like Schindler's List takes you back into the past. I mean, it really is structured as like you're going like in a time machine. I mean, you're going to get in the time machine and we're going to go back to black and white and we're going to see this all unfold and then we're going to go up to the present again. And that, you know, is an amazing storytelling and that's why it uses, you know, you mentioned Hollywood techniques, it uses these to tell a story and it does so masterfully. And we looked at all these different techniques that Schindler's List uses. Showa is not so much getting in the time machine and going back. It's talking to people in the present about what they remember of the past and what they perceive of its importance and its meaning in the present. And so in this regard, it's kind of, it's, it's sort of a way in which the past and the present intersect or fail to intersect. It's like, you know, for example, with the, the, po the many Polish bystanders who knew things. Um, this very, we'll look at this scene in front of the church where Simon Srebnik is talking, they're not really talking at all, they're actually talking around him and like, what did you know? Like, you knew like oh, the Jews were brought to the church. Like, they're brought to the church, and like, yep, they're put on gas vans from the church. And then you're like, what? Like, how did these people know this? Um, and yet there they are, and they knew these things, but they're also really happy to see the survivor back. And you have this very uncomfortable condition, you might say, for the eliciting of testimony. And part of it has to do with jogging memory, right? Because he's very much about you know getting the memories like out there, getting them to be verbalized, even if it's very uncomfortable. And he'll even do things that are transgressive, like the undercover camera on Franz Suchamel, which is in his briefcase and apparently on his body. Um, and the fact that he lied about both of those things to him in order to get the testimony. So this is, you know, an interesting thing, you know, it was this, this is not within Schindler's list, right? It's not, it doesn't have that kind of expose uh, you know, investigatory, forensic kind of analysis. It's about getting testimony in the present about the past, and it's constantly putting the past and the present in dialogue. Other things that we would mention that differ, make the film differ? Or? I feel like it's both here, it's like implying that someone was pretty manipulative. Hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, there's a, there's definitely there's an editorial function in both of them. I mean, certainly this is I'd say actually a commonality. You know, in many ways, is that you know, like any filmmaker, you choose what's going to be next to each other. You know, you choose your sequencing. A film does play linearly, even if it moves, you know, in different directions. And so this is something that Lanzmann makes decisions about. You know, it's like how long is the camera going to linger on this person? You know, how long? You know. <laughs> How much are you going to keep provoking in order to get something out of someone? Because he provokes a lot. Uh, Lanzmann, and it's a kind of irony. There's a kind of, I'd say, even a sort of mockery sometimes. There's a kind of, you know, there's, there's some kind of an inquisitiveness about him. Um, but he makes a decision. You're right. From 300 so plus hours of testimony, how to edit it, how to sequence it, and this also has an effect of telling a story. You know, so let's, you know, we should say that Schindler's List does, or so, Shoa rather, does tell a story. It's just a different kind of story than perhaps the one that Schindler's List tells. And so then it's up to us to figure out how do we characterize that. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's a good topic for a paper. I mean, it would be really interesting to read about how the, it's almost as if Spielberg is like giving us like the secret camera, like we're learning how Schindler is speaking, like we're giving insight into like his, you know, mind. And it's in some ways similar to what Lanzmann is doing with, you know, Suchamel, the SS officer from Treblinka. He's like trying to get insights into how his mind operated and what he knew and, and you know, maybe to assess guilt um, actually after the fact, because Sukhamel had stood trial, by the way, and had, had served time in jail, but was largely absolved of crimes. And we'll, we'll look at the, his, his court documents next time. Mm -hmm. Last. In Schindler's List. Yeah, I found myself watching Shoah uh, still even to this day going, what? You knew, you did what? <laughs> like, you did what? You, you saw, you, you, how do you know this? Right? I mean, there's a kind of sense of outrage in a way that you just don't get with Schindler's List where I think you're right. You're kind of like you're drawn into a story. You're not really questioning it per se. And you could even imagine, you know, you could buy the soundtrack. I mean, you could. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful soundtrack in many ways. I don't know if you'd think of that with regard to show I like by the soundtrack. I mean, no, because it, it's really, it's uprooting of oneself. It has a kind of existential uprooting when you realize what you're, what you're hearing. Yeah, a couple more things, yeah. Yeah, I Right. 
Right, so you think that this is too reductive, essentially. And I think, you know, I would, um, yeah, I, I, I'm sympathetic to that. I mean, it was the, also the reason that I had given a defense of Schindler's List last time. One last, uh, maybe two last questions or points, and then I'm going to move on. Yeah? Shabnak, yeah. Right, right, right. I think I like that your two term disconcerting and creating a sense of, of discomfort or making us feel uncomfortable. And I think that's also Lanzmann's point. He's trying to create a sense of kind of like throwing you out of your reality, almost like our happy comfort of sitting you know, in the film theater and watching the film. It's like, not only do you sometimes want to go, whoa, what are you talking about? But you also like, you start to feel the discomfort that the characters in the film are also feeling. I mean, imagine there you were, this little boy of 13, you come back to the town, all these people knew what was going on with, you know, what happened in Kelmno, and then they're all talking about you. <laughs> and, and, and then, of course, Lanzmann stages it such that you're in the middle, but not saying anything, but everyone's talking about you. It's a very awkward thing. And I think in some ways, Lanzmann's also producing this awkwardness. Right? I mean, that's his point. It's like he's producing a sense of awkwardness and discomfort, also to kind of take us out of our reality. And I think that's really, I mean, um, and when he's most effective, it does that. We're, we're sort of almost like shocked by what we're, what we're seeing and hearing. Did you have a comment? Hmm? These are the people. Yeah, right. There's no, there's no need to make a, reuni a reunion between the actors and the actresses because everything you've seen in there are real people. And no one's acting, right? It's just a question of whether they're going to tell the truth and how much of the truth they're willing to tell on camera. And so then what that means for Lanzmann is how do I produce the conditions of getting testimony out of these people? And, and in many ways, it's about extraction, you know? And he'll try a lot of different things. You know, he'll create awkward situations. He'll ask, he's like, hey, why don't you sing that song again? You know, because you should do it louder. You know, and there's just different things that he'll do. So let's um, look at a couple. I, I think I summarized some of these for you, and, but there's others that you can have. Um, I'd say, we didn't talk about this, but I think it's important. It never hides the fact that it's a film. And I think this is interesting, because when I talk about being transported you know, with regard to Schindler's List back in time, there's a sense, not so much that you forget you're watching a film, but you see that, you almost like see a reality play out. Here, you know, it's kind of disruptive. The director's kind of disruptive because he's in the film. You know, he's there like asking the questions. You see him there. He's kind of hulking around, you know, his shirt's coming out of his, you know, it's untucked a little bit. He's kind of unkempt at times. You have all the translators there because there's a whole process of extracting testimony. You know, the director's in the film, and we never forget that he's using the medium of film and all these camera crews and all these other apparatuses to get the testimony. Like that little car parked outside the hotel in Berlin with the, where the hidden camera is sending the signal. He's like, he's showing you. It's like, surprise, it's a film. And not only that, I'm doing something that's maybe illegal, but I'm going to do it anyway. Here it is. And he exposes that. 
many different stories. You know, again, this is a kind of montage of perspective and experiences. There's a lot of people that are in this film. I mean, again, it's not a single person. It's many people, many perspectives coming together in sometimes very uncertain and sometimes unpredictable ways. I mentioned earlier the magnitude, of, and this is the ambition of the film. And I go down here, the ambition of the filmmaker, I mean, which is he quotes Isaiah, you know. So you're quoting Isaiah saying, I will give them. It's almost a kind of like, well, almost like a God's like uh, divinity perspective. I will give them an everlasting name. With regard to I, the filmmaker, will give the victims an everlasting name. So it's a, you know, it's a pretty big ambition. And in many ways, you could say with some regards, I mean, okay, maybe, maybe he's done that. This is where we're going to concentrate most of our effort, the kind of the red part here, because yes, there's little script, although I imagine some of it, I mean, at least regard to his questions, some of it has been, he's figured out what kind of questions he want to ask. The people that are responding don't have a script. And I think that's important. The people that are responding may say things that, you know, ended up being uninteresting. And that's probably cut out of the film. It's probably those other 340 hours, you know, not all three. I mean, there's many stuff in that 340 hours is very interesting. But I imagine there's some stuff that simply didn't yield testimony. And so he's not using a script. He's certainly not using a stagecraft in the sense of creating a stage upon which something plays out. He's against any reenactment of what the past might have been like. But he is interested in what I would call strategic staging um, in order to elicit the testimony. So the conditions to create uh, an opportunity for good testimony to emerge. And it's not enough just to put the microphone in front of somebody. You have to kind of do things that are, that are in many ways meant to extract the testimony. And that's also where the director plays this really interesting role as a kind of, you know, a person interested in forensics and I would say expose. All right, I think that's all I have. Oh, I was going to remind you of this. Um, I, I gave you this slide before, but I'm going to remind you because it's really on the first three, to a certain extent, Auschwitz. I wanted to remind you of Kelmno because this is the first, um, this is the very first scene in the film. And it's the first death camp that was created by the Nazis. And it happened, I mentioned this before, but it was before the Wannsee Conference. So the December 1941, this is the first attempts at creating a camp that served no purpose other than extermination, right? So there was no slave labor component. They weren't uh, people that were there in a ghetto. They were sent there um, in order to be gassed. And this happened um, in December 1941. And Lanzmann mentions that only two people survived, and in fact, we now know that 10 survived out of some three to 400,000 that were killed there. They were done in mobile vans, and these vans were outfitted with um, a way that the carbon monoxide exhaust fumes entered into, the, um, entered into the van itself, and that's where people were killed, and then their bodies, I mean, horrifically, were dragged out and burned. Um, in the case of Simon Srebnik, the reason he survived is that he, as you saw in the beginning of the film, he was a young boy who essentially was chained, part of like a chain gang by the Nazis, almost like a plaything towards the end of the war. And um, he was actually shot in, when they got rid of the entire camp in 45, he was shot in a pit. And what we understand to have happened is that the bullets didn't kill him. And, uh, and he had managed to survive. Um, with regard to Beltset, this is another camp that is mentioned also. The first one where you have, um, you have gas chambers being used. And it's interesting for our purposes right now is because the SS officer, Franz Suchamel, who's featured in the film, the guy on the undercover camera, mentions Beltset, Treblinka, and Auschwitz kind of as a series of camps that more radicalize the extermination process. So, he describes Beltset as the laboratory, like the first kind of experiments. He describes Treblinka as primitive but an efficient production line of death. And then he describes Auschwitz as the factory, uh, the place where we, they've got it working you know, very, very quickly. Also important to remember that Zyklon B, the, the, the pesticide agent that turns from how this was used in Auschwitz was Zyklon B is a pesticide that's a, a solid. And when it's exposed to oxygen, um, I think the chemical term is it sublimates, it turns to a gas. And when it turns to a gas, um, that's uh, what asphyxiates people. 
So that was not used in Treblinka. Treblinka was also all using carbon monoxide, uh, so also um, motor exhaust uh, to kill people. And this is, he has extensive knowledge of Treblinka. He has a little map that he shows. He talks extensively about being in Treblinka. And um, this was, again, carbon monoxide. The other thing about Treblinka that's such remarkable is just the number of people that were burned in, in large mass pits. And this was the reason um, that many of the, the horrors of the camp are well documented because this process took a long time. So this is, you know, this is in any ways pointing us to the very center of the, the horror of what uh, is the Holocaust. Um, you know, these, these camps that were produced with no purpose other than to efficiently or ever more efficiently exterminate uh, people. So that's where the film begins. Um, so I'm going to close that and actually go here and uh, play this little opening sequence, which is really extraordinary for a number of reasons. I mean, this is obviously, you'll meet Simon Shrebnik, our, the, one of the two survivors from Kalmno, the boy, um, who used to sing a song. And so it begins, the film begins, in fact, with a song, him could say reenacting in some ways, but he's certainly singing a song that he had sung some 35 years ago. stop that because this is already a really interesting filmic sequence for a couple reasons. So there you have, you know, Lanzmann taking the survivor who I believe lives in Israel at this time, bringing him back to Poland, putting him on a little boat uh, in the river where he used to row, asking him to sing a song that he sang when he was 13. And then the very next voice is actually a bystander. It's like we knew him, right? Like we remember, we remember this boy, he was 13 and a half. And so he's putting another witness there. So someone else who has knowledge and remembered him being there. And so this is, you know, the bystander. So you already have the victim and the bystander together, you know, in the very same scene. He's singing and then additional information is being offered by these other bystanders who are aware of something, you know, that was going on. Here the bystanders, right? I mean, really, very similar to Schindler's List in some ways. The use of, I mean, sound that's not connected with what we're seeing, and, and yet we're going to make those connections. Like, who are these voices? Like, who are these people who are all talking, obviously in Polish? We're seeing him on the river singing a song, and then what he's doing, Lanzmann is doing, is putting these different groups back in conversation, back in dialogue with one another showing that their memories and his memories actually have a shared kind of reality. You should also notice, I mean, how slow the movement is here. I mean, this is something that's very, you know, we talked about the rapidity, and maybe, maybe not the rapidity, but at least the, the sequencing of a rhythm or of a tempo of Schindler's List. The tempo often here doesn't really accelerate very much, and if anything, it slows down a lot, or it slows down a little, but almost always it's slow. And of course, that has an effect on us as we're watching the film. Sometimes, you know, we're like, okay, how much longer can I stare at this empty field for the next five minutes I've stared at it? Um, but yet, of course, is the point, right? He's investigating. He's using the camera to like look at everything, to linger 
to help us like, you know, think about how memory works, to almost take us back to another time. And so the fact that the camera lingers so long on his face, almost to the point where we become uncomfortable. I mean, it goes back to your point about discomfort. The camera produces discomfort because it lingers for so long. It's like when your professor asks you like a question in class and there's silence for a long time, right? And then the silence keeps going. You're like, okay, who's going to talk, <laughs> right? It's like that sense of discomfort. He's a master at this. The master at producing discomfort. So it's so interesting. He doesn't say anything, right? So the whole point here is like other people are talking and yet we're seeing him, right? He's silent. And this plays out again later with the church, right? So in some ways, this is again a structure very similar to Shenmue's list, which is sometimes we'll see something that foreshadows something to come later and that maybe even explains it, right? Or helps us to, to understand it. So the silences of his voice and the, and the bystanders completely connect to that church scene, which comes nearly two and a half hours later in the film. But we remember because we, we remember there's a structural similarity. And so here, again, the walk, the silence, a really long time as he lingers until he says something. It's like, and finally he says, this is the place, like this is it. He's speaking in Yiddish, which sounds almost like German here, if you know German. Like, yep, this is the place. And the camera, you know, panning over this empty landscape, which is, again has almost nothing in it. Quiet, slowly looking, slow. So as a film strategy, again, this, this intentional slowness of almost like s slowing us down, like we're having to like stop, take a break. You need to look really carefully, you know, really almost take the patience and the time to begin to understand. And I'd say that's, you know, one of his intentions is to like really take the tempo, which in some ways we like speed, we privilege, you know, kind of motion to really slow us down and get us a chance to reflect and to think and to see almost through, you know, his, his eyes. And it's a strategy that repeats over and over again. So I'm going to actually move to another section that I, we already mentioned, which is the church, because it connects with uh, Srebnik uh, when he actually hears what the townspeople around him are saying. And now how much Polish he understands, I'm not entirely sure, but I think he understands uh, some. So I'm going to zip to that real quick. It's around here. Oops, a little further. Yeah, so I'm going to play a small section. So this is, again, in terms of the visualness, um, this is now almost three hours later in the film because you've gone through the first two hours, now you're in hour 24, second tape, and uh, we're back at the river, we're back in the town. Um, He's singing. It's 
So another song that he, he knows. And so he takes us inside of this church, which is having a service um, for the Virgin uh, Mary's birth. Scoot a little further. I'm going to wait till the church ceremony lets out, and there. turn it down a little bit just because it's all subtitled here. We're going from French to Polish back to French. So they're, so they're happy to see him again. So just to think about the staging here, what he's trying to do. So you take the survivor many years later, you bring him back to the town uh, during a religious ceremony, no less. He could have done any day, but he decided to do that day. The church people, the people who are going to church, probably, you know, peasants, uh, probably they fairly poor. Uh, we find out from many of the other people that live there that, you know, they sell eggs for a living or they sell, you know, rice. Um, certainly not wealthy, certainly don't have a lot of, you know, economic opportunity. It's also a time of, you know, socialism within Poland. Uh, so this is in the 19, probably the late 70s or early 80s when this was filmed. He doesn't ask any questions of Simon here. Uh, in fact, he asks questions only of the townspeople. And so they're essentially talking about him as he's standing there. And it becomes, as you can see, more and more awkward as we find out more and more about sort of their knowledge. So they remember him. They remember he was near dead. And then what's kind of stunning is they remember the operations in which the bands had pulled up to the church. I'll let it play a little more. Et 
then this guy comes on the scene and he has some additional knowledge to provide. And so this is, um, I mean, this is in many ways, I mean, it has, I think it produces many effects. I mean, in some regards, I'd say, you know, Lanzmann is probably pointing a finger. I mean, he's saying like, well, did you all, you all knew this, um, and you wonder, did you do anything? Could you have done anything? Probably couldn't have done anything. I mean, they weren't the ones putting the gas in, but they had some knowledge. Um, one wonders about kind of also the impulse of what it is to know, what it is to do, what one could have done, what it means to testify, what it means to testify in the present, and a series of questions, you know, that again produce uncomfort or discomfort on our part. Hmm? Is unnerving? Right. Yeah, it's an unnerving scene. I like that word a lot. It's very unnerving. And, you know, again, from a charitable perspective, you know, to respond to your question, it's like they probably couldn't have done much more. I mean, they probably, if they had given bread, and I think they mentioned, you know, bread and like vegetables, uh, they remember, one woman says, I remember saying, hey, you German, you Nazi, let's let this guy go. Oh, well, you know. And yet, there they are gathered many years later, and it's a kind of, you know, you're right, they're smiling, they're happy, they're eager to be in the camera, they want to be filmed in some ways. Uh, the crowd grows over time, it's like, what are we talking about? And there's a sense of, you know, we're learning about a history he may not have known that they knew. Um, they didn't know he was still alive. And so, you know, there's this idea, again, Lonsman creating the conditions for a listening testimony that by definition is very unnerving. Yeah. Something that's kind of um, fascinating about it is that the present moment and these awkward feelings that they're mm -hmm. that it really makes you realize that there's something that is happening in the He can never forget, right. But I wonder, do you think they had also been defined around this event? Or maybe they, I wonder if they had never talked about it until then. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think it's like just the, the awkwardness of mm -hmm. it. It's very that we can't even have memories of the events that we I mean, they have very keen memories, apparently, of what had happened. I imagine that for someone like him, you know, being shot, you know, having lost his family, being you know, chained and so forth, I imagine he lives with the trauma every day. Uh, I imagine, you know, you, you don't just give it up. I suspect, with regard to the townspeople, I, I suspect, and I don't know for sure, but I suspect they probably don't think about it really ever. And I think that's the awkwardness in some ways, is like he's making them think about something that they know, but that hasn't become part of public discourse. I don't know. I can't prove that, but that's what I suspect. I uh huh. Yeah, it's like it's like a source of interest. Yeah, he's a he's a he's a he's a famous person in some ways. Coming back. Definitely. Sure. Definitely. I mean, this is why they get. I mean, also plus having a camera and film crews there. I mean, heck, you know, it's 1975. We're going to be on you know TV or film. It's exciting. Uh, you know. 
And to be sure, the talent, you can tell by the way they're dressed, you can tell by the way they talk, you can tell also by what they say in terms of like their worldview, they probably don't leave the town. Um, some of the people in there say like, I grew up in Auschwitz, I've never left, I've been there my whole life. Um, it's a relatively small kind of, you know, I'd say, you know, parochial existence. Um, certainly having to do a lot with class, uh, with poverty, abject poverty. Uh, the fact that they're not Jewish, I mean, they're, they're Catholic, and they go on with their lives. You know, they go to church, they go to work, it's probably very simple. And then this guy from the past comes back and like, kind of like, whoa, this is something we all went through and now we kind of can confront it together. Um, and maybe there's something even cathartic about that. Maybe there's something that allows you to do an honest confrontation with the past, which is to say, yes, the awkwardness, but also maybe you're able to connect in an honest way to something that you, like a memory that you held, or the memory that he held, and somehow come to terms with it. Maybe there's a reconciliation. I mean, maybe. Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. And they like little other little pieces come out. Exactly. Thank you for pointing that out. This doesn't just end with the fact that they knew things. It ends almost with the fact that they seem to be maybe implicated in certain ways. So like, how would you have known uh, that these suitcases contained, you know, stuff? Uh, how would you know? I mean, um, and then. The very the punchline of the whole thing is essentially that maybe they deserved it. Maybe that uh, because they were Jewish, they essentially you know deserve to die. That's the implication at the end, and that's a very uncomfortable kind of moment, you know, in the film. So that you could still hold these beliefs that maybe justify uh, or maybe give some justification. Let's just say, yeah. Let me. I'm just going to kind of gonna, in the interest of moving forward. I'm just going to kind of go a little further here. And um, they knew a lot, it turns out. This is their... Oh. And you can read, you know, the transcript so you can go a little faster. Yeah. <laughs> so at some point, you know, he's again not talking. He starts to smoke a cigarette. You know, he's just like, they're just talking about him, right? He's like, this is the huge crowd, and he's like, are you serious, right? Like, like, the big the vans, they came, they came right up to the church. Interest of time, I'm going to stop it, but hopefully, you had a chance to see the scene. And it goes on uh, further with that final explanation as to um, maybe, um, yeah, maybe that they had deserved it. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, a, certainly an uncomfortable scene. I wanted to kind of go to that next aspect of corroboration because following this kind of revelation that there were gas vans that the gas vans had carbon monoxide, that the gas vans had pulled up to the church where the Jews who were imprisoned in the church were put into the vans. The next scene after this entire part plays out is a document. And that document, let me see actually, actually it's a little bit further than that. <laughs> were there many, oh, this is the part on the church. I mean, if you hadn't seen it, it's extraordinary. Is 
that. I mean, it's extraordinary, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like, wow. It took 50 gas vans, because that's how many people could fit in them, in order to empty out the church where the Jews were imprisoned, and that they could make even this estimation up. Right? Again, just, you know, again, you know, knowledge that you had harbored in your head for this long, and it then comes out in the form of testimony staged, you know, many years after the fact in this, in this very, you know, disconcerting, unnerving um, circumstance. So a little while later, it's actually about 20 minutes later, we see a document, and I want to show you that um, before we talk a little bit about perpetrator. We see this document, it's around, yeah, it's around 152 here, yeah. It's a document about the preparation of the gas vans themselves. And one of the things, so in the, in the film transcript, I, of course, gave you that as well. But I wanted to draw your attention to a little bit of it because, for one thing, this document actually exists um, in, here it is in German, um, from June 5th of 1942. It's a secret, um, secret stuff for the Reich, uh, secret Reich business. And it talks about uh, changes well, the fact that 97,000 people had already been verarbeitet, which is like processed or worked, uh, but worked here means not in a sense of like worked, it means like you had put them through something. So had been processed in these existing um, vans, but that we need to make some changes to the vans because what's happening is they're sometimes tipping over and also they're having to put, they're having to like refit them in different ways. And so the company that provided these bands, um, I'm actually going to silence this while it goes, because you don't need to, it's all in English there. Um, the company that provides these vans, called Zauer, um, exists today. And so he drives around with the camera. He goes back to this company, like its headquarters in Germany, and you find out sort of the fact that this company still exists. They make uh, these kind of cars still, uh, not gas vans per se, but they make trucks and cars, um, and that they had been specially hired to take normal trucks that you would use to transport furniture and things uh, in order to become gassing vans. Um, so this is the, these vehicles are very spacious, you know, they can um, use, you know, lots of people can fit in them and so forth. But what had happened is that uh, when people rush the back doors in order to get out of the van, the thing would become unstable, potentially tip over, and therefore, this is the problem here, the vehicle stability was affected. And so in 1942, this, um, this letter was written to the company in order to fix some of these issues about uh, the creating a, a stronger axle so that the car wouldn't tip over, and also a better cleaning system, uh, which is really, you know, disgusting to imagine, but the issue is that if you imagine, if you could imagine, the idea here is that it takes 15 or 20 minutes to asphyxiate a group of people in the car. So they're literally talking about this and saying that when that happens, people claw at each other, they, they, they panic, they obviously jump on each other. The vehicle has to be cleaned out and it needs to have a better drainage system. So this letter is exactly about the practical problems involved in asphyxiating people. You know, it's remarkable, right? I mean, like, I don't know. I mean, I, like, what it, part of he's doing here is also exposing the logistical reality of carrying out the final solution. So you hear from all these church, you know, the people are going to church. You hear from the victim, you hear from the bystanders, and now you see the perpetrator. And the perpetrator through the documents, right? So the, the, the document here is providing you with evidence. And in each case, it's like each corroborates the other. You can say, oh, were there gas vans? Well, actually, everyone in the town remembers the gas vans. Uh, the guy remembers the gas vans still, the, 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 the victim. And it turns out there's a document from 1942 about making the gas vans work better, right? So this is what I mean by the corroborative aspect of the, of the, of the film. It's like each perspective builds on and deepens the other perspectives. So here is the thing about the front axle being overloaded. So I'm not going to play this entire part for you, but it's worth looking at this letter in, in some detail because, uh, and if you're interested in the German, it's really interesting. It's actually a little bit longer. One of the things that I didn't realize until I looked at the German is that this letter is partially edited down, and so there's a lot more information in the German than there is in the English translation. But uh, these, there's actually six images. I'll link it to the, 
um, to the syllabus if you're interested, but it tells you a lot more information about the changes that had to be made in the, in the trucks, these gas vans. Okay, let me, I'm gonna, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna just talk about one last thing and then I'll, I'll take up um, from Suchamel next time. But I wanted to just say something about the undercover camera and, um, oops, let me see where this is, around two minutes, four. Yeah, so this is the first time, this is where I'm gonna just, I'll start and kind of end at this point right here. But um, this is what I meant earlier when I said that he exposes the conditions a possibility for testimony. So he's also telling you how he's getting this testimony. He starts in this little van here, which is outfitted with the you know, antenna and with his camera crew in there, who's checking the sound and the image which is coming back from him. I mentioned he had a briefcase, which had a camera in it, and he also had a camera fixed to him, both of which he didn't tell um, Franz Sukumel that he had. And so, for us, like we have that knowledge, right? It's like we kind of like are watching this, we're going, okay, okay, he's got this crew set up outside uh, this apartment building, they're working and listening, and he begins this conversation um, with uh, one of the SS officers who was there in Treblinka in 1943. You know, it's like, are you ready to give your testimony? Yes, I'm ready, we can begin. How's your heart? My heart's okay, you know. He died shortly, I think a few years after that. I think he died in 1979. Um, and so this is towards the end of his life. Um, so here we are inside the van, you know, listening to the sound. So this is shortly, he's there in Treblinka at the time when the Warsaw Ghetto had been entirely evacuated and most of the Jews from Warsaw were sent to Treblinka. Uh, so here, this is an example of, this is a camera from the briefcase where Lance, Lanzmann and Sukhamel are both in, this, in, the, in the picture. The other ones, when he's just like looking at the Mr. Sukhamel or the map, it's a camera coming, ostensibly a body camera from him. So what he declares is that he was there at the time when Treblinka was operating at full capacity, which meant about 15,000 people were being killed every day. Um, we know a total of around eight or 900,000 people were killed, so he was present at this moment, uh, which is you know, putting him at the scene of the crime, right? I mean, that's the very first point here, is I was there at the scene of the crime, I'm telling you this, and then he begins to describe over a sequence of seven different parts of this film. So there's like seven different parts where he talks about this experience. He'll testify to what he knew, what he saw, but also at different times say that, you know, I wasn't guilty of different things. I was really an observer or I wasn't the one, you know, gassing anybody. It wasn't, it's not entirely clear. And this is interesting from his testimony. It's not exactly clear what he did and he doesn't actually say, but he does tell you a lot of knowledge about things he saw and how it operated. And so, you know, to, for us to like pass judgment on him, it's actually very, it's very tricky. Um, this film probably could have incriminated him further. However, as I mentioned, you know, in passing, he had actually already stood trial uh, for crimes uh, in Treblinka as an accessory to murder. He was imprisoned for only four years. Uh, then he was um, relieved. And then he spent the last years of his life um, outside in Berlin, I believe, uh, until he passed away in, I think, 79. I have to look at the date. 
So what I'd like you for next time to take on is go through the entire sequence of all the times when there, he's talking to Franz Suchamel, and then as a further thing, because Treblinka connects to not just the perpetrators, but also the victims, it's look at the testimony of Abraham Bamba, which is the barber, Jewish barber, who had been part of a forced labor battalion who cut the hair of people before they were gassed. So those two scenes are the ones I'll talk about next time, and we'll take it up from there.